Thank you. Thank you, Ed, and, and great to see uh, lots of familiar names and just hellos from uh, all around the country and wide, all around the world, from overseas to me, but then I might be overseas to you. So great to see you all and thank you for coming uh, along and giving up this precious time in, in a cray-cray world, in a time where we're probably feeling a bit overloaded or overwhelmed with so many opportunities to learn and share and connect. So thank you for choosing to, to be here at this one. And uh, I was watching a conversation play out on social media the other day. Um, and the usual thing, you know, you get your box of popcorn out and start eating it because you can see a couple of people having their philosophical or their opinions and they're exchanging them. And it's almost, it's like a tennis match, you know, one person lobs their view uh, or opinion over the net and the other person comes back with, uh, with a backhand and then sometimes the match seems to escalate to the point where someone <laughs> starts like smashing comments and it starts to escalate more and more. We eat more and more popcorn watching what's going to happen with this. And then at some point, uh, the, the research says people are either going to mention Nazi Germany or they're going to belittle the other person and call them names. This, is, this actually happens, right? But what I saw happen here was one person continued to add more data and stats and information as their argument or the basis of their argument. And then the other person was able to share uh, an actual personal story that also had facts and data and information in it. And then I watched the conversation kind of come back down to earth. And there wasn't a, we'll agree to disagree, but there was a more healthy respect for each other's points of view. And what I saw there happening is what often happens when we're wanting to communicate information or lead change or influence people is that people get up on their soapbox. And the soapbox probably the, the size or shape of these sorts of boxes up on my shelf here, was from the times where soap traders would unload their boxes from, from ships and, and other transportation. And then kind of preachers would get up on the box to try and get some elevation or to try and get a little bit higher than the crowd gathering around and then they would sprout out their views. And so what we see in communication so often is people get up on their soapbox, blah, 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 deliver their message. And then there's, okay, I'll get off my soapbox now. I've had my you know, sprout of information. And I like uh, liken this to what happens in our organizations and teams is that a lot of leaders get up on their soapbox and start you know, blah, blah, blaring to the masses, letting us know what we need to do. Um, usually it's uh, couched in the terms of we're going to cascade information through the organisation. And that whole nature of something having to cascade is coming from a higher place and dropping down on people. It's quite imposing. It's forcing. And I don't see that that's how change can happen anymore. Uh, and if it was happening up until now, uh, well, the current world we're in is absolutely changing that. So today I wanted to talk about this idea of how we think and how we adapt how we think, but also how we can help others adapt how they think. We're often focused so much on changing people's behaviour, uh, wanting them to do things differently. But if we spend a little bit more time helping them understand how they think and how we think, we might be able to get a bit further in that. So today I want to cover through some of the things that we might be assuming, uh, some of the default processes we might be using, and uh, introduce you to this technique of uh, adaptive thinking. And the Institute for the Future said a few years ago, nearly 10 years ago, they said that adaptive thinking would be something we'd need about now, 2020, here we are this idea that we are able to kind of quickly uh, adjust what we think and look for relevant solutions. So this is what adaptive thinking is about. How can we quickly shift or pivot our thinking so that we can find more relevant solutions and flexible solutions? Now, I'm also keen to see how we can use the skills we've already got to handle what's going on in the world. 
and then how we can take the next step of uh, adapting the skills we've already got to the next world beyond that and the next world beyond that and how things continue to change. So I'm coming at this from communication. My background was, uh, as Ed said, he'd, he'd uh, seen me do some visual work and I've got my flip chart here set up in my office uh, facing the windows. I'm in Port Melbourne in uh, Victoria in Australia. Luckily, I've got some nice daylight coming in and I will be putting some information up here. No PowerPoint. No PowerPoint from me today. Real stuff. I'll be sticking some stuff up here. So you might want to follow along or screenshot some stuff as we go. So if Ed was saying he saw me and was first exposed to some of my visuals, but my background was actually in words and communication. So as a communication specialist, and I did some lecturing at university in undergraduate and postgraduate work on, uh, on how people take in information, how they process information, how they understand what the heck's going on in their world. So any of you that uh, were connected on LinkedIn, you'd see that I'm often posting most days on something to do with the broader topic of change, the broad topics of um, sense making, uh, information, uncertainty, these are the sorts of topics that, that interest me. So today, adaptive thinking, how do we quickly change our minds and our ideas to flex with the world? And then as leaders, how can we help other people also adapt their thinking? It's like the last thing we want is people to be stuck in quite rigid ways and um, be difficult for us to help them move. So uh, not only did the Institute for the Future say that adaptive thinking might be something we'd need, but the World Economic Forum, they're the ones that have been putting out lots of information on uh, not only the updates around the health situation in the world, but also just general information about trends, themes. They're kind of putting out their future ideas, their future thinking, and this is going to come back for us later on today. I want to talk and share with you where they're operating in terms of their thinking. They look a little bit behind, find the facts, and then see how they might be able to project into the future what's happening. And their, their mere behaviour of doing this is helping other people start to adapt their thinking. So organisations can do this individuals can do it and I absolutely want leaders to be able to flex their own thinking so that they're able to influence their teams better. So here's one of the first things that I was thinking of today. I got myself a, a blank page and drew three circles on it. Three blue circles heading in a kind of upward direction there. And what I'm seeing happening is I mentioned about sense making, like we're trying to connect the dots with what's going on. So we're trying to make sense effectively of what's going on. Every day we're doing this. In our own life, we're trying to connect the dots. What's happening? What do I need to do about it? And sense making is another one of those skills the Institute for the Future said we need, and heck, don't we need it? Like we are deep in information and goings on. And us humans, we are simply trying to work out what the is going on. What's going on and what do I need to do about it? So individually, we're trying to make sense, but also if we're leading a team, we're also trying to help them make sense of what's going on and try and work out what do we need to do about it. So from making sense, this is great change leadership. When stuff's going down, if you can help people understand what's happening, and make good, clear sense of it, and people look at it and go, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I get it. That makes sense. That's the sort of response you'll get from people when you know you're making sense for them. And it's through that that we're then able to perhaps explain to people what change is going on or what change is coming. But you'll see there's a gap in the middle, and I think there's often a piece missing with our change leadership and our change communication. And of course, it's connected to this topic today, right? Adaptive thinking. There's something missing between when we make sort of factual sense of things to then when we try and push or drive or encourage or force or roll out a change 
in an organization or a team or a household, right? A lot of change going on at the moment. I've seen lots of families putting up uh, charts on their kitchen wall, trying to make sense of chores that need to be done, uh, meals that need to be cooked, <laughs> uh, times that the dog can be walked. And we're trying to make sense of all of the stuff that we would like to do, that we need to do, that we have to do in these times. And that is then directing us towards making a change. So rather than feeling like we're forcing people to change, I think the bit in the middle is what often is missing. And it is meaning. We can make sense to lead change, but we also need to make meaning of what the heck's going on. So simply making factual sense, connecting the dots, looking back in hindsight, this is how we make sense. Hey, look back on a bad relationship, right? You can totally make sense of it all now. It makes lots of sense. You can see patterns, you can make connections. You go, ah, oh, that's what was going on. And it's only in hindsight that we do make sense. So if we're making sense of stuff and then we try and change things, I think we kind of have a disconnect here. Unless we make meaning for people, we can show them facts and details and data and connect the dots, but until it makes meaning, and you might want to put a little heart next to that word meaning, but until it connects with someone and makes meaning to them, they're less likely to be engaged, interested or connected to that change. Making sense first, making meaning, and then being able to move into an area where we can make change. This is what I think is needed in our ways of thinking and adapting our thinking. So a question for you, do you know how you think? Do you know how you think? In fact, I bought a book recently and it's called How to Think. And it starts to uncover a lot of the things that we might take for granted, that we have such uh, rituals, such habits around how we think. And we are the only creatures on earth who think or can think about how we think. Yes, we're the only ones who can think about how we think and therefore reflect and make some corrections and make some adaptations. So we're in, while it's a very difficult time, we're also in one of the biggest kind of learning loops we've probably ever been in our lives, where stuff is happening and we're able to look back and make sense, but we're also able to make some meaning of what's going on connect to that information and then change becomes easier for us. So some of the other things I want to talk through today include, hey, change, right? Any of the change leaders on the line today, uh, if you've been slowly trying to launch or roll out or introduce or transform an organisation, it can be quite overwhelming to see how quickly people can change. Of course, a lot of the change has been forced on us or required of us, but it shows that humans are quite resilient in that we are able to adapt quickly. And many people are finding ingenious solutions at home from whether it's what meals they're cooking to how they've set up their home uh, offices. Uh, a shout out to Sandy Marmalee. Uh, she shared a photo the other day of her ironing board and uh, there we go, we've got a stand-up desk, right? So ingenious adaptations and solutions. Loving seeing some of the home office setups. Again, very ingenious. We've got people face, uh, facing blank walls and then on the other side of their computer is just tons of crap, right? All the stuff that's in their junk room, which they're making into their... Uh, their work from home space. Other people are finding hutches or corners, desks in garages, in basements. I even saw someone sitting in their car the other day with one of those stable tables on their lap just so they could get some peace and quiet. So this is our examples of how we're adapting very quickly to find ingenious solutions to things and finding solutions to problems that we're faced with. So change leaders are probably seeing great examples of, yes, people can transform, 
people can change when it's required of them, hmm, how can we borrow some of this for when we do need to make changes in organisations? So one of the big topics that this requires, and I've got a book for this, is um, my book Leader as Facilitator. So my view is that if we can be more of a facilitator of change, we're going to be more able to kind of bring um, people along or help people along. So facilitation means ease. How are we making things easier for people? And are we, in fact, making things more complicated? Are we putting unnecessary layers of things in between? So think of the word facilitation. I want to write that down. It doesn't just mean, you know, standing at the front of the room and leading a workshop or leading a conversation. Facilitation is about ease. Facil means easy, right? How do I make this easier for people so that once they do it, they're able to move on to the next thing? And this is part of kind of extending that process of change, uh, extending this from sense helping people make meaning, and then helping people move into that new world of change. So facilitation is a key part of this. I also like the idea of thinking for yourself, hmm, am I someone who's kind of flexible and adaptive? Or am I someone who's inflexible, maybe resistant, perhaps stubborn? Right? <laughs> if someone's in your circle, like what would they say? Are you someone that's spontaneous, flexible, adaptable, responsive, these sorts of words? Or are you a little bit more of like hard-headed, hard-nosed, um, stubborn? I love it when people go, oh, I'm stubborn. I think, look, you're just determined or persistent. Uh, they're still really good qual uh, qualities to have. But if we're resistant to change, like we're not even entertaining an idea, that ain't adaptive thinking. That's not going to help us. So let me pause for a minute and just see there's a few comments here um, that, yes, certainly businesses are suddenly discovering that work from home is an option. Right? So they've maybe talked for years about we can't do this, so they've not had an adaptive way of thinking, and now they're going, oh, hang on a minute, my mind has changed. Uh, what was the book called? It was called Leader as Facilitator. Leader as Facilitator. And the subtitle is How to Inspire, Engage and Get Work Done. And I address some of the cliches of facilitation because there's some hanging around from last century. Uh, I would hate you to fall into some of those patterns that trigger people into ways of behaving that aren't helpful. Yes, the ironing board was a great idea for a stand-up desk. I love that. Uh, thanks for the suggestion of the book called How to Think. And yes, all the posts that are around at the moment that are titled, So That Meeting Could Have Been an Email. Here's more examples of people learning more about adaptive thinking. Um, a question from Hi Alexandra Stokes to say, do I think that this adaptability will endure after COVID-19 is over? Or what does the research say? Well, what's that uh, saying or statement that, you know, a mind once stretched never returns to its original shape? So what we're doing is experiencing we are being forced to adapt and change and we're responding to that. So, hmm, how are we going to respond? Will we retreat and shrink back to the things that we don't like doing or that didn't work for us? Or might we have a greater kind of tolerance to adaptation? Might we have a greater tolerance to trying more things that are about change? Good one. Good one to watch. And one ever question. Yes, we also want to say if you want to share your message uh, to the whole group, make sure you click all panellists and attendees. And another adaptation floating around a bit more on social media you know, you think the message might be private here. And of course, when the printout or the uh, download of the comments from webinars and Zoom comes out, there are all the messages. So a few people have said they got caught out over the last week. This will help them adapt. Huh? That's adaptive thinking. Okay, so this blank page behind me, uh, what are we going to put on that? Hey, draw along with me. 
won't be very complicated. I'm interested to have a look at a model or a way of thinking about thinking. So I remember we're the creatures who can think about how we think. So this is what we'd like to see. So I'm going to have a look at a good old quadrant model. Now, if I was consulting business, I could earn millions of dollars from one of these consulting models. And what I've brought myself along, I've been able to tap into my stationary supplies at home. I'm fond of some stationery. I'm fond of paper, post-its and markers. So today I'm going to be using a few, a few things from the pantry, from the stationary pantry. Now, what we're going to look at here in terms of how we think and what adaptive thinking is, is to first look at when we might be in the past or perhaps dealing with the details. Down, down, down in the depths. If that's the past and the details, what might be up here? Up here, of course, is going to be the future and not so much about details yet, because if it's in the future, we actually don't know what it is. So I believe that we have ideas. We have ideas for the future. We've got kind of projections about how we think things might go. So if we look in the past, thinking about the future, down in the details, because we've got history we can refer to here. Here we don't, we've just got ideas, we've got, possibilities, we've got hunches, we've got blinding flashes of possibility coming to us. And then on our left and right, I think the left brain, right brain stuff might have been a little bit debunked in recent years, but I still see a lot of people loving the facts, dealing in facts, and dealing with the data. So then on the other side, any guesses what might be over there, if it's not the facts, maybe it's the feels. So over here, let's put the feels. And if that's not data, it's perhaps our opinion. So you can see that that example I gave earlier, those people who are like bickering on social media, as happens most of the time, people are often coming from here and they'll be quoting uh, facts and data and then someone over here will share their personal experience or their personal opinion and they're going that, 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 that. And it is this kind of opposite ends of a scale. No wonder, right? No wonder we have differences of opinion. So let's look into these quadrants. None of them are wrong. This isn't a judgy kind of thing. It's just more of a location to say, where are you with your current thinking? And could you go somewhere else? So let's see this first one. Uh, the colours don't mean anything except colour, just to show some difference. So you're not classified as a yellow person and therefore you have to do something to be categorised. No, it's just a bit of yellow paper. So let's look at what this is. If we've got fa facts, <laughs> facts and data, and we're looking at the past and we're in details, we're probably doing what I would call a bit of uh, the behaviour of authenticate. Authenticate. Someone asked me yesterday, what marker are you using, Lynn? Here it is. It's the beautiful Ecoline brush pen. I just buy them online, have them delivered. Brush tip, can't go wrong. Like, you can't write shit with a marker like this. It just looks nice. So if I am authenticating with data and past stuff from the details, usually what I'm doing is checking or verifying that something was true or that it happened. And if you're there, good on you, you know, you're collecting lots of data, but is that what you're using to change your own opinion? Are you using that to change other people's opinions? So in this current era, there is a lot of data going on. Right? It's what we're using to make sense. We're connecting the dots by having a look at what's happened in the past. We are tracking information. We're watching freaking graphs go up through the roof. And it's all about the facts and data that are available to us from the past. 
it's authenticating information and a lot of people then want to go further and verify, is this true? Is this correct? Beyond here, let's have a look what's next to it. What if we stay down here in the past, dealing in details, but it's a little bit more in the feels, right? No, not necessarily facts, could be, but not presented as facts, presented as feels. Feelings, emotions, much more of a kind of right brain experience, I guess. And when we're there, I see that it's not just authenticate that we need to do, but the beautiful human activity, which is to validate, to validate someone, to listen to them, to confirm that we've heard what they've said. I mentioned before about cliches with facilitation. Uh, you can do a classic here. Look, I hear what you're saying, Ed, but we really need to move on. Right? Bad, bad stuff, bad facilitation technique. It's trying to kind of cliche or dataize our response and it's not a very human response. So when we're dealing with people's feelings and their opinions, we must validate it. It may not be factually authentic, but for them it sure is. For them it sure is. And I don't think there is anywhere near enough of this going on in the world generally. I think there's a bit more happening now because we're finding more of our humanness and humanity. And so to validate is to see someone, not just to say, I see you, but to give them some of your eye contact, you know, to give them some of your time. To validate someone means to take some time to listen and to confirm that you've heard what they've said. Now, thinking back to the idea of changing an organisation, if we're just pushing facts and data and we don't deal with the feelings and views that people have about the past, that's going to thwart that change and transformation process. And we see this a lot, right? It comes back to bite us on the ass. Or we hear people complaining, oh my God, they won't leave the past, they won't move on. And that's not, not their fault. It's us as leaders, we need to validate people better. And that means taking a bit of time and perhaps planning that into your change or transformation process where you're going to deliberately spend some time and validate the shit that's going down for people. A few years ago, I did some work with Metro Trains here in Melbourne uh, when they first started operation of the rail network. And so I worked through designing one of their, um, what you call it, in induction programs. So all the staff had to do it and they were introduced to the new owners and operators of the rail network. And all of those workshops I ran were facilitated. It wasn't just a presentation of saying, here's the company, this is what we're doing. It actually spent some time going back to the past and just finding out what are your opinions about the history and the past. And every one of those workshops that I ran, we spent some time talking about that. We didn't squish it. We didn't uh, close the lid on it. Uh, and there can be that feeling of, oh, we're, you know, we're going to open up a can of worms and there's going to be too much outpouring. But this is where facilitation is good, right? Because if you can take what people are saying and simply validate it, that, yeah, that must have been really hard. Wow, that must have been challenging. What a difficult time to be in that sort of job role, etc. Those sorts of things that we actually see what someone's gone through. You will be surprised how they are more willing to move into the future. So this is one of the things I see in a lot of teams. They're not willing to spend a little bit more time here to validate the feels and opinions of people. Uh, because then later on, they complain that these people keep bringing them back to the past or they won't move on. But we simply need to spend some time and seriously validate that, yeah, that was shit, that was hard, that was a challenging time. So facts and data in the past. Let's move up now and have a look at what facts and data 
and the feels might be like into the future. Let's take this one. Look at that colour. Whoa, beautiful. Facts and data about the future. How do we know? How do we know what it is yet if it hasn't happened? Then it must be some sort of extension. Our thinking, then we're taking our ideas and changing them for the future. Facts and data in the future, I believe, are about anticipate. We're trying to understand what might happen, what could be. Hey, futurists, all you futurists out there, they're like looking through stuff, projecting, trying to see into the future what might be possible, what might happen. And this is predict. I don't mean it like glass ball, <laughs> let me tell you your future. But what happens is, and we're seeing it with the graphs and information today, is that there are projections and modelling being done. There's forecasting. This is where we project into the future with information we have now. So already you might start to see where do I like to hang out with my thinking and to become more aware of where your preferred place is and how adaptive is that and how is that helping you adapt and how is that helping you lead others so they adapt. Because if you've got a favourite place you like to hang out, then it could be that you're always presenting information from that place or you're always arguing from that place or you're always debating from that place. So thinking about how can I adapt my own thinking first so that I can then help others adapt their thinking. So the final one to finish here, any guesses on the colour, the colour, the colour? Green. Green. No, uh, no method to the colours, they're just different. When someone sees a screenshot of this, they'll know which models I was talking about. So here now we're talking about in the future, we don't know what it is yet, but we've got some feels, we've got some opinions and ideas about what the future could be like. Wow, what a place to be. This is one of the places I like to be, is to go, what's possible? What might be up there based on the sense I'm making or the experience I'm having? And I think this is where great leaders can spend some time because they're able to put something on the table. They're able to initiate something. They're able to start off a topic. And this really is about the idea that we do lead from here. Yeah, we can lead from down here and go, look, here's the data, work harder. <laughs> we can go, here's the data and here's what I reckon is going to happen in the future or here's what we might need to be doing. Have you considered this? Have you considered that? So where do you like to hang out? If you think to uh, some information you might have researched lately, what do you like dealing with? Do you like dealing with the facts and data that's reporting or authenticating or verifying something? Or do you like hearing people's stories, for example? So do you like listening to people? Anyone who says, oh, I love meeting people and hearing their stories. And I go, wow. So you, you love listening to the details in someone's past. And I think we all know people who, you know, they're awesome storytellers, right? They can be so entertaining. They're able to take the things that happened and bring them to life and share their experiences of what happened. Highly entertaining, really touching too, deeply emotional, right? So many books, so many stories, films, lots of creative and artistic expression comes from here, from people wanting to be seen, to be, you know, validated to experience their, their story, their feelings. Over here, if you're dealing mainly with data, getting the numbers, going deeper on the numbers, drilling into the numbers, um, into the past, seeing what that's about. Is that somewhere you like to live? And a question's popped up here. Does the media play in anticipate? Oh yeah, what do you reckon? They love it. They're projecting, they're basing 
lots of reporting on current facts and I think some less reputable media like us to think that they are playing sweet with this, but there's not. There's plenty of media not doing well with existing facts and data. And so we see their predictions, their exaggerations, their dramatizations. Um, the other day I was just scanning through the headlines of, um, yes, as someone Sue said, almost to the point of catastrophizing, right? That's the job. You think the job of media, when I was at um, lecturing at uni, one of the subjects was journalism. And our job was to, you know, kind of fire the students up to realise that they have to find drama, tension, conflict, um, not necessarily exaggeration, but it was to look for the, the exciting and tension-filled element in the story. So, yeah, there's a lot of this going on at the moment. And I reckon if you do a bit more of this at the moment, see how it's the direct opposite? If the media's doing all this shit, <laughs> come over here, listen to people's stories, and then we need to move up here and start to lead them in the hope of a better future or a, uh, a community or a connection that keeps them going. Um, Someone here says they're 50% pink, 30% yellow, and 20% the others. So half that, um, about a third that, and 20% the others. So a little bit more on the facts and data side. That's a great self-assessment to do, is to say, where do you like to hang out? What's your kind of um, space? So thinking now, where you like to hang out, we know about confirmation biases, right? We look for information that validates our existing views, which means if we are thinking in a particular way, we will probably love the information that validates where we like to hang out. So to be more adaptive in our thinking, try going to the opposite. Try going to an opposite area where instead of always talking about, oh my God, what's gonna happen? What's going on? Maybe spend some time having a heart-to-heart -heart with someone, really digging a bit deeper with what's going on. Another suggestion from Niall, hello, 5% orange, and no patience for old stories. Ah, this is, what is it? Like it can be, um, yeah, frustrating, or we think it's time-wasting. And then here comes facilitation again, right? Instead of just opening up and saying, hey, tell me your story, put a constraint in place where people maybe make a note of a story, read it out, or prepare a story, share it with someone else for a few minutes, and then gathering some of the themes from the story. So long-winded stories, we want to put some sort of constraint in so that people are able to share a story that maybe has a particular theme or outcome or some launching point that gets them started. Uh, jo, she's saying she's 50% green, 30% um, yellow and 10 and 10. Love it. Love hearing you do your self, self assessments. So if you're doing a bit of a self assessment, hmm, what could you be doing to look out for some of the others? If you're not a data fan, then Go just explore some data and see how some of it's being presented, how the details are being authenticated and verified, right? It's quite impressive to see the incredible visualisation that's being done with the COVID-19. Uh, it can be really enlightening and give you some ideas about how you might be able to present information and data to others. How do you go about capturing feels from the past? I just mentioned that. Give people some constraints around the story um, rather than long-winded stories going for shorter. Um, not to say you don't want to hear them, but to put some sort of frame or constraint around it. Future, uh, if you're into talking about the future and the facts, uh, or you're not, you know, maybe you're like, la, 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 don't want to hear, don't want to know. You know, it could be in denial let a little bit of information in. There's some, been some brilliant articles by highly respected people who are talking about what they think the future could be like. This can be really intriguing reading, is to have a look and go, wow, look at how that person's seeing it. How might I be able to utilise that? Or how might I allow that to change my thinking, right? This is adaptive thinking. 
And then the, the fourth one here, if you're not into initiating stuff, like if you're more of a follower into followership, then maybe there's something you could initiate or lead. And we're absolutely seeing people do this. Um, Mandy Gunsberger recently launched on Facebook a, a lockdown, a shutdown shout out, she called it. So go have a look at her Facebook page and the Instagram page where it's just giving shout outs to people, right? It's really sharing the opinion and some ideas for the future. Great initiatives that are coming out of this innovation, this necessity. Um, a couple of other comments here. Some people, um, Ronak is saying 50% orange, 30 green and 25 the others. I love that you're doing your maths. Any of you data people really making sure the numbers add up? That's, that's where you are. Um, lovely, Joe. Data backs up the feels. That's nice, right? So you could take some of the feels of the story and see do we have... Uh, data that's validating that and that will like doubly validate. Um, Joe is the same, we've got a 70% yellow and orange together, so maybe hovering somewhere in the middle. Um, we love making stories based on data. Good on you, Ankita, because that is exactly some of the stuff the world needs. You know, how do we make this information palatable, enjoyable, interesting for people who might be fearful of the numbers or fearful of what it all means, is that if we can bring it over into what the story of this is, it can really help people. Um, and then you also said 30% uh, green and you'd like to do a bit more in the pink area. Um, and someone <laughs> says, is it, I can only see part of your day. Michael wants to see the data on all of the self-assessments. I love it. <laughs> this is fantastic. Or no data, exactly. So intuition is valid as well. This is one of the ways that we judge or measure or validate what's happening. And data can drive some emotional reactions from people, says Rachel, which drives them then into pink or orange. So we can have information here, data, as Rachel says, can drive more emotional reactions for people. So it could push them up into here for future ideas, perhaps re um, reactions, responses to what they can do, or it might push them over here to get a bit more feels with people. Beautiful. And then the um, poll results are up from, uh, from Ed's login section, uh, kickoff section. So what I wanted to do really was to bring this session to a close and have, uh, have some time for questions. But it, it reminds me of a session I spoke at, which was um, with software testers. Uh, it was probably February or so last year, 2019. And the topic I talked about was called Try to See It My Way. And it was to help the tech side of a business understand what the heck the business side of the business was doing or the management side of the business. And I think there's been some notorious uh, differences of opinion and different ways of looking at things and different ways of handling data. And we could almost say, yeah, there's a lot of leadership going up here talking about what the future's like but we've got so many people in the organisation dealing with the information down here and there's sort of a, a disconnect. So even though the topic then was called try to see it my way, I think it really is, I need to try and see it your way first. If I can see something your way, then that is going to adapt my thinking. And then once I've been able to adapt my thinking, then I can come in and influence persuade, communicate and engage with you. If I first understand what your preferences might be and I understand that, which adapts my thinking, then I'm more likely to be able to adapt and work with someone to help them see things in another way. And less of this, oh, let's cascade information down. I really love us to stop that sort of thing. So next time you see... Uh, a popcorn moment where you're eating popcorn, you're watching perhaps an argument play out, a debate, a heated conversation. Think for a moment, are people talking facts and data or are they talking personal stories? Are they reflecting on stuff that's already happened or are they talking about stuff that might be happening in the future? 
And simply identifying these can help us not only think more about how we think. Remember, we're the only creatures who can do this. We can think about how we think, which allows us to be able to change how we think if we wish, which allows us to then observe the thinking of others and work with them to help adapt their thinking. So what I'd love to do is um, connect with you on LinkedIn if we're not already. Um, I'll be setting up a bit of a portal with a, a range of different um, trainings, um, posts, resources in this time, and, I'm, uh, and I'll be communicating with the people in my, my network about that. So do make sure we're connected either on LinkedIn or, or through my website. I'd love to keep in touch with you. Um, what have we got? A couple of other questions. Um, we've got, it kind of reminds us how people have different love languages. Yes, that's exactly right. Is it Chapman? I uh, can't remember the name offhand, but the book Love Languages and talking about some people like, you know, acts of service, some people like um, dedicated time, some people like physical touch, etc. cetera, um, that we have different preferences. And the sooner, the sooner we can find out what someone else's preferences are, the easier that path of making meaning for them comes. It's easier for us to move from making sense of something. We then begin to connect better with them. We're able to make things, make meaning for them, which then leads us to be able to change. Um, and we've got, love the idea that you get the other person to talk first. I know, it's amazing, isn't it? Any business analysts on the line, it's like, shut up. You've got to elicit information from, from your client or from your sponsor or from your project people. Uh, from Peter, hello, New Zealand love. I always make, Lynn, I always make so much sense. Danka, danka to you. Thank you. Great seeing me in action. Thank you, Joe. Gary Chapman, thanks, Joe. That's the Love Languages author. A great, uh, a great thing to have a look at in these times when you might be closer to your loved ones than ever or you might be further away from your loved ones. So if you can work out what their preference is for love languages, you might be able to strengthen that connection. Thank you, Vicky Young. Hello. Thanks for another great session. And Angela always loves listening to me. Oh, this is great. I can just tune in and get all this beautiful feedback. It's wonderful. Um, a cascade of info for behaviour change doesn't work in the general workplace. No, it doesn't. But in times of a crisis, like COVID-19, it is good to have one voice. Yes, one source of truth. And that is the direction of change we need to go through. True. And this is when crisis communication is quite different. Uh, certainly something I worked with in the, the public relations field and um, in university working with students and, and lecturers around how we communicate to learn and to inspire, and then also how do we communicate in times of a crisis. Good stuff, wonderful session. Thank you, Sarah. Um, thanks for not subjecting us to PowerPoints, Alexandra. Much nicer for a remote session. It shows it can be done. Yes, it can. You can draw stuff. You don't actually need a flip chart, but I'm using one today. Um, but you can stick stuff on the wall if you like. And what else have we got? Is it live streaming on Facebook? I think Ed will be able to sort us out for that. Um, people say, <laughs> yeah, agree. Someone says, as much as I'm a passionate technologist, I can't go past some good stationery. Where are you? That so feels, right? It is a tactile, emotional kind of response. Um, one in Singapore, how do you help logical people access more of their feeling? Hmm, maybe we could spend a little bit of time listening to someone else's story of feeling. Um, I know there's a number of TED Talks where people share their experience and then they build or bridge to some learning. So that would be something you could do immediately is tune in to a couple of TED Talks where people are sharing their personal story. Take a note of how they do that. And that could also help you identify where you've been, what you've done, how you might be able to share your experience. Uh, what else have we got? Plus one, yes, feels more connected. Facebook Live, we've got the link for that. And as Ed says, the recording's also gonna go up to 
uh, YouTube. Is there a questionnaire that we can fill in to get the exact measure of where we sit in the grid? I feel like I'm a bit of everything, says someone. I will put that together for you. I've got a series of uh, like facilitation questions. So just shoot me a message and I'll, I'll send you a link to do that. Um, how to be uh, Danuka is asking, how do we get some advice on how to be more orange? Um, that was perhaps similar to what was asked from Juan in Singapore about how do you help people, uh, help logical people access more of their feelings. So if we can watch or observe, so we're very good modelers as humans, if we can see it happening and being demonstrated by someone else, we're often in a better position to then replicate that. So watch someone deliver their emotional story. Uh, and I'm just directing it to a TED talk or two because I know there's, there's plenty of personal stories there where people share what they went through and then what the lessons were that they learned. And, and then once we watch that, we can start to see how do people tap into what those emotions were. And thank you, and thank you. Uh, other people saying they feel like they're floating in between. So what I'll do is I'll pause here. Um, but yeah, just to remind you, I'll be setting up a bit of a community in the in the coming days, and I'd love you to come into my world where I'll be sharing lots more stuff uh, and supporting you during these uh, these times where we must work at adapting our thinking. Right, we've been forced to adapt the way we think and the way we behave. How can we use some of this momentum to perhaps see things in some different ways? All right, I'll pause there um, and perhaps hand back to Ed. And you've been sending and sharing some links there, which is great to see. You yes, 